Uhuru! Welcome to Black Power Talks. I'm Dr. Matsumela Odom. And I'm Dexter Mlamwingu. Uhuru means freedom in Swahili, and freedom is on our minds 24-7. All 2022, on Black Power Talks, we would like to salute the 50th anniversary of the African People's Socialist Party, formed in 1972 to complete the Black Revolution of the 1960s. In this episode, we engage what is amongst the most important interventions into socialist and communist thought ever, colonialism as the mode of production. Since its inception, the African People's Socialist Party, the Uhuru Movement, and the ideology of African internationalism has clearly stated that the African struggle for liberation is against colonialism. Colonialism has been defined as the foreign and alien domination of a people for the purpose of economic exploitation and political advantage to strip a people of all human and civil rights and to rule without regard to law. Point 13 of the African People's Socialist Party 14-point platform, originally written in 1979, reads, We believe that the primary struggle of African people within the U.S. during this period is to throw off the alien U.S. colonial domination, which is responsible for virtually every hardship imposed on black people by this government that is identifiable as a, quote, black problem, unquote. In his recent treaties, Colonialism as the Mode of Production, Chairman Omalia Chatella synthesizes 50 years of his relentless leadership and the party's relentless leadership on this question and points the way forward. In the body of this episode, Chairman Omali notes that Marx and quote-unquote Marxists, developed the term mode of production, which according to Marx includes, quote, everything that goes into the production of the necessities of life, end quote, including the, quote, productive forces, labor, instruments, and raw materials, and the, quote, relations of production. According to Marx and Engels, for individuals, the mode of production is, quote, a definite form of expressing their life, a definite mode of life on their part. As individuals express their life, so they are. What they are, therefore, coincides with their production, both with what they produce and how they produce, end quote. Marxism argues that capitalism emerged as the mode of production that succeeded feudalism, the previous mode of production in Europe, as a progressive development in society. Colonialism and imperialism are merely late stages in capitalist development. As we have stated on Black Power Talks, African internationalism vehemently disagrees with this analysis and in fact reverses the relationship. Imperialism and colonialism produced capitalism. It was colonialism that pulled Europe out of feudalism, and this was not a progressive development. Europe created a better life for itself in the white world at the expense of the rest of the world. Africans and indigenous people, in fact, had better lives taken from us. Chairman O'Malley should tell us colonialism as the mode of production is chapter two of his political report to the third plenary of the 7th Congress of the African People's Socialist Party. Today's episode is composed of excerpts from the January 16, 2022 episode of O'Malley Taught Me, the regular Sunday study held by Chairman O'Malley Ashitella. This episode can be viewed in its entirety at the Burning Spear TV YouTube page. In this first segment, Chairman Amalia Chatella outlines colonialism as the mode of production. The African People's Socialist Party's leadership on the colonial question and colonialism as the genesis of Europe and Europeans. Let's take a listen. A lot of people of various organizations and personalities talk about what they believe in. And what we're saying is that we have a revolutionary theory and that this theory, African internationalism, again, is simply the worldview, how we perceive the world, uh, stemming from a historical materialist investigation and analysis of the whole world, with the starting point being the experience and the role of Africans and Africa in the advent of capitalist imperialism as the rise of white power. Through African internationalism, we were able to reveal the fact that the oppressive conditions faced by Africa Africans and the majority of the peoples of the world are globally connected to the experience of affluence and power by the white population. 
that is dependent on a pedestal of colonial domination. African internationalism connects the current political and economic configuration of the world to the colonial enslavement of Africa and African people. It proves that capitalism emerge, emerges as a parasitic world economy born at the expense of Africa, Africans, and all the world's peoples who are subjected to foreign and alien colonial rule up to this date. The th theoretical work of the African People's Socialist Party has developed beyond the foundational worldview that informed the revolutionary anti-colonial movement initiated more than 100 years ago by the Universal Negro Improvement Association and African Communities League led by Marcus Garvey. With the founding of our party, the African Revolution has regained the global revolutionary impulse that an array of our enemies sought to destroy with the assault on Garvey and the UNIA by US and European colonizers who were aided by incipient neo-colonial forces within a forcibly dispersed colonized African nation. African internationalism reveals that Garvey's cry of Africa for Africans at home and abroad was more than a simple emotional declaration. It was the demand that carried within it the recognition that Africans globally called by a variety of names and forcibly dispersed to and colonized in a variety of places are one people whose future and destiny are irreversibly connected. We are all Africans. It was this understanding by Garvey that influenced the UNIA slogan, one God, one aim, one destiny, a profound fundamental philosophical statement the materialist significance and effectiveness of which are not obscured by its idealist reference to God. The essence of these slogans in the 1920s challenged the machinations of the newly founded international U.S.-initiated colonialist organization and precursor to the United Nations called the League of Nations as it was engaged in declaring what parts of Africa should be parceled out to European tut tutelage following the first imperialist world war to redivide the world among European colonial predators. The UNIA slogans identified the core question defining a parasitic world economy. UNIA slogans identified the core question defining a parasitic world economy and the central role of Africa and Africans. The slogans were examples of the universality of the African revolution advanced by Garvey and the UNIA ACL in the first quarter of the 20th century. During the 50 year history of our party, I was to discover that the European colonialism that assaulted Africa was central to the emergence of the global colonial mode of production that overturned feudalism as a mode of production in Europe. It was this that created a new system with relations and forces of production centered on the extraction of value from the colonized by European colonizers which vastly enriched them and the Western European world. This differs from the standard Marxist conclusion that capitalism is a mode of production replacing European feudalism. Our work has shown that European feudalism was replaced by a colonial mode of production that Karl Marx defined as primitive accumulation, which stemmed from, among other things, turning Africa into a warren for the commercial hunting of black skins, to quote Karl Marx. Unlike Marx, African internationalism rejects the idea that the European attacks on Africa and Africans are important only for the development of Europe with no significance for the colonized who were transformed into mere objects of European history and mischaracterized by Marx as primitive accumulation facilitating the capitalist development of Europe, which he saw as progressive. Our conclusion that colonialism is a mode of production marks a signal moment in political theory. It is an understanding that liberates the brains, the worldview of the colonized. We have been actively developing this within our party for some time. We began this foray into an investigation of colonialism as a defining feature for Africans in the U.S. as early as the 1972 founding of our party. This distinguished our position from that of others who, like ourselves at one point, used the term colonialism interchangeably with the word racism. Even then, although we had not worked out the primary features of our theory, 
It was clear to us that describing our struggle as one against racism was bowing to reaction to philosophical idealism. I defined the colonial question in 1978, struggle with, white, with the white left. On February 18, 1978, I spoke to an audience of mostly North American leftist settlers in San Francisco, California, further elaborating on our developing theoretical conclusions while engaging in struggle with Prairie Fire Organizing Committee, or PFOC, an interventionist, opportunist, colonialist group that claimed the main political contradictions in the world to be white and male supremacy. This line functioned to undermine our colonial analysis and kept white settlers and their interests central to our struggle. This position was made possible by the effectiveness of the counterinsurgency war on our movement and the resultant destruction of our organizations along with the imprisonment and murder of African anti-colonialists. Once African anti-colonialists were effectively neutralized, white groups like PO4C became spokespersons for our struggle while claiming to be taking leadership from Black revolution, something that usually meant hustling a relationship with imprisoned African men who may or may not have actually been revolutionaries. Expanding on our still developing position on colonialism, I explained the distinguishing development of the party's anti-colonial position to the mostly settler colonial audience in San Francisco, and I'm quoting, The African People's Socialist Party was not the first to disclose the colonial condition confronting Africans within current U.S. borders. Malcolm X was one of the first leaders of the Black pro-independence movement to articulate our major contradiction with U.S. imperialism as colonialism. Stokely Carmichael and the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, which were leading forces in the mid-1960s, also put forth an anti-colonial position, as did the Black Panther Party during the height of his political influence in this country. Albert Mamie, author of The Colonizer and The Colonized, first published in 1957, also dedicated the American edition to the so-called American Negro, also colonized. However, what our party did discover that made it for a qualitative leap in understanding how to move toward liberation is that the US, in the U.S., colonialism represents the relationship of class to race. Prior to this discovery, our party was one with most of the pro-independence movement in describing ours as a struggle against racism. At the same time, we were calling it a struggle against colonialism. That is to say, our movement, still under the ideological influence of the primitive petty bourgeois civil rightists, whose colonialist mentality often equated freedom with their proximity to white people, incorrectly used the terms racism and colonialism to define the same set of circumstances and oppressive structures responsible for our condition. However, at the moment, we were able to understand that what we had been describing as institutional racism was the same thing we meant by the term colonialism, and that these same set of circumstances and oppressive structures imposed on our people were also defined as colonialism historically throughout the world, our ideological and political development increased a thousandfold. This understanding of colonialism helped us to place the responsibility for our oppression squarely upon the shoulders of the North American ruling class. Our party was able to discover that our main or primary struggle is against colonialism, which is an imperialist form, therefore necessarily having class connotations, and which utilizes the ideology of racism to justify and obscure the fundamental relationship that African people within the U.S. have with the capitalist, colonialist, ruling class state. We discovered that colonialism is the condition we suffer from as a people, and that racism is the ideology that justifies or obscures that relationship. Colonialism is real and concrete. It is a human-made condition that can be struggled against. On the other hand, we discovered that racism is the ideas in the heads of North Americans colonizers. Racism is the attitudes displayed by North Americans, which makes you dupes, allies, and collaborators with your ruling class in in its attacks on us, which reinforce and maintain our colonial relationship to the U.S. North American state. When Black people struggle against racism as the main or primary contradiction, We are struggling against the ideas which are in the heads of the vast majority of European 
and North American people. There is no identifiable source of political power to overcome. And the enemy must necessarily be viewed as a politically homogeneous and monolithic group of people who are racially defined and have no exploitable political differences and who, because they are defined racially, represent a permanent condition which can never be overcome short of their extermination. This is not to say that the anti-Black ideas in the heads of North Americans cannot harm us. History will not tolerate such a claim, but the way in which they harm us is that they serve to maintain our colonial relationship with the North American capitalist colonialist state. Therefore, it should be clear that what we generally refer to as racism is simply individual North Americans carrying out the U.S. policy of colonialism, unquote. The party uh, was in the vanguard of characterizing the conditions of existence of Africans in the U.S. as colonialism, far ahead of anyone else. Our stance was always in opposition to the liberal and idealistic declaration of, of racism as the condition we are fighting. We were constantly in our practice and our developing theory, collecting the evidence of colonialism being more than, than merely bad thoughts in white people's heads or a policy of various European powers. Colonialism was revealing itself to be a mode of production. One popular reference we have used to make this point comes from Hosea Jaffe. In his book, A History of Africa, Jaffe provides historical evidence of the process of European colonialism destroying and replacing the feudal mode of production in Europe and becoming a mode of production embracing the world. Jaffe's book also reveals the material basis for European opportunism and for racism as part of the superstructure stemming from this colonial mode of production. The book Ezwe Leitu E Africa, the political report to our party's third Congress, quoted Jaffe extensively from his book, A History of Africa, which provides a historic record of the development of parasitic capitalism out of the enslavement of Africa given rise to the European or white world. Jaffe's details of Europe's relentless assault on and conquest of Africa provide the historical basis for the consolidation of Europe and the amassing of European and consequently North American wealth that is considered the Western way of life by white people, including its advanced representatives of the white left. And we're going to quote Jaffe now. The Portuguese seized the Azores in 1431, and Pope Martin V legalized an already established European slave trade. In 1445, the Portuguese began slavery from Gori off Senegal. By 1447, they had reached the Gambia River. And the first marked African resistance was reported when they tried to extend the slave traffic in Guinea. By 1460, missionaries were, tra- were slaving in the Congo, using Angola, the Kumbundo king. In 1462, the Portuguese were in Sierra Leone. In 1469, Gomez was threatening the civilization of Ghana. In 1471, Fernando Po penetrated the Cameroon's coast. In 1482, the Portuguese were erecting their fortified slaving posts at Damina and Sao Miguel in Guinea and Lunana. In 1482 and 8 through 85, Diego Cao slaved up the Congo River and down as far as Namibia. In 1484, the Alviera uh, Ve- uh, came armed into the Benin court and Namibian Koi Koi fought off Cao's uh, conquistadores. Financing the Portuguese and accompanying them on some of their voyages were, voyages were Germans from the old Hanseatic League, particularly from Antwerp, Frankfurt, and Hamburg. Hidden German colonialism was beginning. In 1487, Koi Koi tribalists resisted Bartolomeu Diaz's armed bands, but Diaz succeeded in rounding the Cape of Good Hope. In 1488, the Portuguese missionary Du Covilha tried to undermine the feudal regime of, of Iskander in Iskander in uh, Ethiopia. 
By 1490, Arguin was shipping a thousand slaves a year to Portugal and its fortress town of Damina. A plantation economy was started in Santiago, uh, Cape Verde. By about 1500, Portugal alone had taken some 700 tons of gold out of Africa, a massive primary accumulation for nascent still weak capitalism worth in today's money, 8 billion US dollars. The first installment of some 13,500 tons of gold worth about 160 billion US dollars estimated by Mauni of Dakar and Paris universities to have come out of the Niger Sudan complex alone during the whole colonial period. This is just so clear in terms of how the whole European, Europe acquired its wealth and development of the system uh, inside Europe, uh, uh, from Europe uh, throughout the world. By 1490, Sao Tome was a a slave port and slaving and sugar plantations worked by slave labor had reached Benin itself, where the king was corrupted by missionaries. In the same year, the missionaries were baptizing those chiefs who collaborated while Wolof and other peoples were opposing armed resistance to the slavers. The capture of Grenada, the last Arab stronghold by Spain, by Spanish mercantile feudalism in 1492, paved the way for an even more rapid escalation of European colonialism in Africa. By 1500, Vasco da Gama began the Portuguese destruction of the civilization of Zanji and to a lesser degree of Mono Matapa, and from then on, all three types of African despotism began to oppose mass resistance to the Europeans. By 1503, Lisbon was already exporting African slaves to the Spanish slave owners in the West Indies, and Portugal had surrounded almost the whole of Africa with its armies of slavers. In 1493, Pope Alexander VI had divided the world into Spanish and Portuguese spheres of interest in effect, pronouncing for the first time that Europe was to rule the world. That's the end of that quote there. But Jaffe continues. The 15th century then saw the multiplication of the primary accumulation of European capitalism. And Africa played the most important role in the process as the principal arena of European colonialism, the very genesis and foundation of the capitalist system. From the turn of the 16th century, the Americas and Asia were added to this foundation and out of this totality arose capitalism and modern Europe itself. Before capitalist colonialism, there was no Europe, only a collection of feudal mercantile and tribal towns, farms, villages, discrete states and kingdoms vying and warring with each other, just as in Africa, but on a different property basis, that of private property in the land. Europe was neither a concept nor a reality, at most a vague idea that Arabs, but not European, had had long ago of someplace northwest of Greece. As long as Europe remained isolated from the world, there was no Europe. When it became connected with and dependent on first Africa, then the Americas, and finally Asia, it began to become a reality and an idea. Only when Portuguese, Spanish, French, Italian, Dutch, English, German, Danish, and Swedish confronted and clashed with Africa, America, and Asia did the need arise for them to consider themselves as a set, a whole different from, hostile to, and eventually superior to African, uh, to Africans, uh, Aboriginal Americans, and Asians. Colonialism gave them a common interest. This common interest, slaving, plantations, the world market, looting, precious metals, spices, and territories, and territory markets, and sources of wealth, was also the source of the conflict among themselves. From 1500 on, they had already started to quarrel and fight over the colonial booty. In these intra-European conflicts, Portugal and Spain had in time to give way to Holland and France, and these in the 18th century to Britain, while German hidden colonialists 
Calvinists, Catholics, and Jews alike steadily garnered what they could of the, of the booty without shedding their blood or losing their own property in the process. The scramble for Africa that led to the 1884-1885 Berlin Conference had its roots in four centuries of struggles between the European powers for the division of Africa. Colonialism, the basis of European unity, was also the basis of its disunity. Europe was born out of colonialism as the exploiting, oppressing, negating pole that tried always to destroy and assimilate its opposite pole, the rest of the world. The first form was that of primary accumulation from the 14th century to the 19th. The next was that of regular accumulation with an inertial momentum carried forward from the primary accumulation. With capitalism arose Europe, and with Europe, the myth of European civilization, a civilization based on African slavery, American plantations, Asian spices, precious metals from all three non-European continents based, too, on Indian numerals, Arab algebra, astronomy, and navigation. An Arab Indian took the Gama to India from Mombasa and Chinese gunpowder paper and compasses. This non-European, European civilization was the Narcissus-like admiration of its own conquest. The sword, gunfire, murder, rape, robbery, and slavery formed the real material basis for the idea of European superiority. It was out of this process that the very idea of a European man arose, an idea that did not exist even in etymology before the 17th century. Before the slave trade in Africa, there was neither a Europe nor a European. Finally, with the European arose the myth of European superiority and separate existence as a species, as a special species or race. There arose indeed the myth of race in general, unknown to mankind before. Even the word did not exist before the lingua franca uh, of the Crusades. The particular myth that there was a creature called a European, which implied from the beginning, a white man. Colonialism, especially in Africa, created the concept and ideology of race. Before capitalist colonialism, there were no races, but now suddenly and increasingly there were races. Once born, the myth grew into a reality. Mankind's ignorance about the existence of that European invention, race, was so deep that even as late as 1619, after two centuries of slaving, the Portuguese writer Lopez could portray the European and the non-European not as such, but as equal men, dignified and altruistic. But Lopez's view was exceptional. Long before his time, racialism had become an instrument for mass expropriation, slaving, and decimation in Africa, as in Asia and America. Colonialism was always racialist, from soldier to missionary, king to traitor, and from the 19th century, from capitalist to socialist. The chronology of the expansion of colonialism in the 16th, 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries is also the chronology of racialism, but it is at the same time a history of struggles between capitalist colonialism and the lost past. Colonialism won this war clearly and thoroughly everywhere, but it could not win by merely destroying the lost past. It had to transform it to assimilate its exploitative non-communal features into capitalism itself and reshape the communal features to make them part of the capitalism. The process of transforming the enemy into a part of the victor was long and difficult for Europe. The resistance was never ending. Many African people still say they were conquered and dispossessed, but never defeated and subjected in spirit. Nor was this resistance even and simple. And it is with the complexity of it that we are now concerned, unquote. So this part of the book, Israel Lay to E Africa, is relentless in establishing the basis of our declaration that although clearly some imperialist powers saw a policy of colonialism as a means of their own rapid development, colonialism is more than a policy. It became the mode of production that replaced European feudalism 
as a mode of production. It was colonialism that transformed the world into a single economic whole, a single political economy within which slaves and masters were destined to pursue the means of producing and reproducing life, each at the expense of the other. You are listening to Black Power Talks, produced by WBPU, Black Power 96.3 FM in St. Petersburg, Florida. Today we are discussing colonialism as the mode of production with excerpts of the presentation made by Chairman Amali Shatella. Well, now that we have established colonialism as the mode of production, what is to be done? In the next segment, Chairman Omali Yeshatella explains how white workers and leftists, not just the bigots and most backwards elements of their society, gaily shared in the feast of colonial loot. White communists, Chairman argues, must commit to the struggle against colonialism under the leadership of the colonized. African people produce and reproduce life for white people. Africans, in all in unity with our struggle, must overturn colonialism and place the power into the hands of African people. Or, as we say at Black Power Talks, get up and do something. White workers and leftists uh, uh, gaily share the feast of colonial loot. As long ago as 1858, in a letter to Karl Marx, his comrade and collaborator Frederick Engels offered this materialist observation about the ability of white people to unite with their ruling class in the exploitation of the colonial world. And quote here, for a nation uh, which exploits the whole world, this is, of course, to be, uh, is, is, of course, to a certain extent, justifiable, unquote. Later, in 1882, in a letter on the same subject, Engels commented to Karl Kowski, quote, you ask me what the English workers think about colonial policy. Well, exactly the same as they think about politics in general. The workers gaily, gaily share the feast of England's monopoly of the world market and the colonies, unquote. In the book, East Relay to E Africa, we provide evidence that the unacknowledged colonial mode of production plays a major role in the consciousness of the most advanced sector of the white colonial population. It shows the basis for the perennial white opportunism and betrayal in favor of maintaining the place of white people on the pedestal of African exploitation as colonizers. We state, while today white left nationalist opportunism has been forced to acquire a sophisticated articulation of its unity with maintaining the oppression of Africans, the pedestal which white capitalist power requires for its existence, there was a time when it made no attempt to hide its colonialist, which is to say imperialist worldview. At the 1907 Congress of the Second Communist International held in Stuttgart, Germany, which was attended by more than 800 delegates, the majority resolution declared that under a socialist regime, colonization could be a force for civilization. Understand this. At the 1907 Congress of the Second Communist International held in Stuttgart, Germany, which was attended by more than 800 delegates, the majority resolution declared that under a socialist regime, colonization could be a force for civilization. While many white communists have attributed the reactionary stance of white people, including the white working class, to their being confused are duped by the white bourgeoisie. These excerpts from arguments by prominent communists at the Congress reveal that though these advanced representatives of the white working class, as to say the communists, were quite clear in their colonialist motivation and that in their view, the benefits of colonialism to the white world did not require the existence of the bourgeoisie uh, and understand the bourgeoisie being the, the capitalist class. The following excerpts of, uh, from arguments by supporters of the majority position. They include uh, Hendrik uh, van Kool from the Netherlands and Eduard Bernstein from Germany. Here is Hendrik uh, van Kool from the Netherlands. Quote, the minority resolution also denies that the productive forces of the colonies can be developed through the capitalist colonial policy. I do not understand at all how a thinking person can say that. Simply consider the colonization of the United States of North America. 
Without it, the native peoples there would be living in the most backward social conditions. Does Elitable want to take away the raw materials indispensable for modern society, which the colonists can offer? Does he want to give up the vast resources of the colonies, even if only for the present? Do those French, German, and Polish delegates who signed the minority resolution want to accept the responsibility for simply abolishing the present colonial system? As long as humanity has existed, there have been colonies. And I think that they will exist for a long time yet. Surely there are a few socialists who think that colonies will be unnecessary in the future social order. Although we do not need to discuss this question today, I ask Lederbour, does he have the courage now under capitalism to give up the colonies? Perhaps he could tell us what he would do about the overpopulation of Europe. Where does the people who must immigrate go if not to the colonies? What does Lederbour want to do with the growing production of European industry if he does not want to create new export markets in the colonies? And does he, as a socialist, social democrat, want to shirk his duty to work continually for the education and further advancement of the backwards peoples? Especially for Germany's sake, I regret that the social democracy there has limited itself to questioning the need for colonies and the benefits they bring. You saw in the last election campaign how the masses were hypnotized by the thought of the benefits to be gained from the colonies, not only the petty bourgeoisie, but also the industrial workers. Edward, this is Edward Bernstein now from Germany. We must get away from the utopian notion of simply abandoning the colonies. The ultimate consequence of such a view would be to give the United States back to the Indians. The colonies, colonies are there. We must come to terms with that. Socialists too should acknowledge the need for civilized peoples to act somewhat like guardians of the uncivilized. LaSalle and Marx recognize this. In the third volume of Capital, Marx wrote, the earth does not belong to one people, but to all of humanity. Every people must administer it for the good of humanity. And LaSalle once said, the right of a people to its own development is as little an absolute right as any you will find. It is tied to the condition that there is some development, but peoples who do not develop may justifiably be subjugated by peoples who have achieved civilization. Our economies are based in large measure, large measure on the extraction from the, from the colonies of products that native peoples had no idea how to use. Uh, here's Van Kolb. Various comrades have said there is no way to improve the colonial economies. This is false and contradicts the history of colonial policy. Through our socialist activities in the Dutch parliament, we have achieved significant advantages for our colonies. The Dutch, they are the ones who brought the first group of captured Africans to what is now the United States. Why should we help only the workers of Europe and not those of other parts of the earth? Arrayed against us in Europe are the mighty forces of capitalism. Why should we not also take up the struggle against capitalism in other continents? Nowhere else could we achieve easier and bigger victories than there. Lederbohr uh, said the majority's efforts are reactionary. He says, I simply do not understand how he as a man of science can fail to recognize that the colonies must first pass through a stage of capitalist development before you can begin to think of socialism there. So. We are working for the revolutionary development of the colonies in order to facilitate the transformation of the feudal state into a modern one through capitalism to socialism. A leap from barbarism to socialism is impossible. Uh, and there's a shout of very true from the audience. To deny this is not only unscientific, but stupid and short-sighted. Why in God's name should we not be able to raise constructive demands for this development, just as we do for the questions of militarism and tax laws. Kowski maintains the thesis that colonial policy is conquest, is imperialism. This formula, formula is completely wrong. You should learn better grammar. Today, to be sure, colonial policy is imperialist, but it does not have to be. It can be democratic as well. In any case, it is a grave error 
of Kowski's to put colonial policy conceptually on a par with imperialism. I hope he will see that this is unjustified and that he will strive to make good the error. Kowski said that we must win the confidence of the native peoples. How does he hope to win the confidence of millions of people of other skin colors if he does nothing for them? Very good comes a a shout here. We in Holland have the duty and the right to tell the comrades of other countries about our experiences. We Dutch socialists have gained the confidence of millions of Javanese, but in Africa, the people know nothing about the German social democracy because until now, it has not done its duty. If you want to win the confidence of the native peoples, then you must actively engage yourself, uh, yourself in the colonial question. The learned Kowski made matters even worse with his advice on how to develop the colonies industry. We are supposed to take uh, the machines and tools to Africa, a theoretical pipe dream. That's supposed to civilize the country. Suppose that we bring a machine to the savages of Central Africa. What will they do with it? Perhaps they will start up a war dance around it and there's loud, loud laughter or increase by one the number of their innumerable holy idols, laughter. Perhaps we should send some Europeans to run the machines. What the native pe- native peoples would do with them, I do not know. But perhaps Kowski and I will make uh, the attempt. Perhaps theory and practice then will then go hand in hand into that savage land with the tools and machines. Perhaps the natives will destroy our machines. Perhaps they will kill us or even eat us. And then I fear that rubbing his belly, given my superior corporeal development, I would have precedence over Kowski laughter. If we Europeans go there with tools and machines, we would be defenseless victims of the natives. Therefore, we must go there with weapons in hand. Even if Kowski calls that imperialism, and then there's a very loud, very true from a part of, of the hall. And so and I think it was really important to share this. Th- these are from the communists. These are not the ordinary the white workers who uh, people are often offering up excuses of not being able to recognize their interests as being against colonialism or uh, like some people like to refer to uh, anti-racism. Uh, uh, but these are the advanced attachment of the white population. These are the communists that are making these statements. And this was a majority uh, position resolution that passed in 1907. 800 delegates were there from around the world and some 60,000 people or so uh, participated, white people, in the outdoor uh, rallies that they had there uh, during that uh, entire process of of the the communist uh, international. So white communists must struggle to struggle against colonialism under the leadership of the colonized. Uh, as we summed up in Israel Leitu e Africa about this very explicit and telling quote from the most prominent white colonizer leftists and socialists of a century ago, and here we quote, African internationalism will not allow our party to construct some fanciful notion of reality upon which to base the policies of our party. We are materialists. And we base our policies on the world as it actually is, rather than basing our policies on the world as we would like it to be. Those who ignore the real world and base their policies on the notions in their heads on the world as they would like it to be are idealists. The fact is that capitalism was born as parasitic white power, and it must be defeated as parasitic white power. Genuine communists of all nationalities must be consciously committed to the overthrow of white power and white communists must be committed to the struggle for the victory of black power over white power. The beginning of the process of white communists in the US and the world to abandon the interest of imperialism and to integrate their own interests with the interests of the toiling masses of the world is to subordinate their interests to the struggles of the oppressed peoples of the world to overthrow parasitic white power. In the U.S., this can only be done through joining the anti-colonial struggle for black power. Concretely, this means joining the African People's Solidarity Committee, an organization of and subordinate to the African People's Socialist Party, the advanced detachment of the revolutionary African working class and poor peasantry. And that's the end of the quote from Israel Leitu. 
In this political report uh, to the party's third Congress written more than 30 years ago, we stated that the profound opportunism of white people manifests itself as extreme violence and near total self alienation of white people from the vast majority of the world's peoples. This alienation is expressed in many ways, but none so significantly as the inhumane barbaric treatment white people have participated in and or encouraged against other peoples, often with the only provocation being the desire of whites to take or keep possession of ill-gotten resources which have become essential to the white way of life, unquote. We were able to conclude that the formation of the African People's Solidarity Committee and its ideological and structural relationship to the party were grounded in a firm theoretical basis because of our understanding of colonialism as the mode of production. By the time of our party's sixth Congress in 2013, our theory had developed to the point that we celebrated its meaning as a tool for recapturing the brains of the colonized and for setting world history on a correct course. In my political report to that Congress, I was able to write, our African internationalist theoretical contributions serve to break the shackles historically imposed on revolutionary theory as perceived through the lens of oppressor nation intellectuals, colonizers, whose worldview was determined by their existence on the pedestal of our oppression. African internationalism for the first time allows for Africans and the oppressed of the world to become the subjects of history, defining our own destiny, something not possible from with the theory of Marx or his contemporaries and followers, and unquote. So Marx and Marxes developed the term motor production, which according to Marx, includes everything that goes into the production of the necessities of life, including the productive forces, that is the labor instruments and raw materials, and the relations of production, the social structures that regulate the relations between humans and the production of, of, of goods. According to Marx and Engels, for individuals, the mode of production is a definite form of expressing their life a definite mode of life on their part. As individuals express their life, so they are. What they are therefore coincides with their production, both with what they produce and how they produce. It is a combination, that is to say, the mode of production is a combination of the defining relations and forces of production at play within a society. From their viewpoint as, as European colonizers sitting on the pedestal of African oppression. Marx and Engels erroneously defined various modes of production throughout human history as universal stages of development, supposedly taking all human society from lower levels to higher stages. Marx and Engels defined these stages as going from primitive communism to slavery, to feudalism, to capitalism, which they see as a progressive development over feudalism, and eventually full-blown communism, apparently given legitimacy by the fact that it has been achieved by Europe, functioning as a template for human development. So uh, with this formula, the movement of European feudalism to world capitalism continued to be a mystery, despite the effort by Marx to resolve this with his definition of primitive accumulation, the turning, and, he, and this is Marx's quote, uh, the turning of Africa into a warren for the commercial hunting of black skins that signalize or uh, signal the rosy dawn of capitalist production, unquote. Marx said more about this, but it all boils down to the fact that it was colonialism that developed an impoverished, diseased, ridden Europe out of feudalism, and that the feudal mode of production with its specific features was replaced by the colonial mode of production with specific features revolving around the parasitic extraction of value of human and material resources from the colonized to European colonizers. In January 1990 presentation I made to a conference sponsored by a party in St. Petersburg, Florida, represented another occasion where the question and theoretical implication of colonialism as a global phenomenon was addressed to a mass audience of African people. 
In addition to Africans throughout the US and some members of the American Indian movement, AIM, participants included representatives from movements from Guyana and South America, the Gambia, uh, West Africa, and Azania, commonly known as uh, South Africa. Uh, the conference was entitled Freedom Weekend and was designed to uh, address the issue of a heightened counterinsurgency war being made against our movement. Here's an excerpt from that presentation, I'm quoting. Uh, in explaining the emergence of capitalism in human history, quote, Marx defined the relationships that people who got paid for the labor had with the bourgeoisie as wage slavery. He said that wage slavery in Europe needed as a precondition slavery pure and simple in the new world. To us, that meant clearly that the fundamental contradiction in the new world, in the world, is not the contradiction that occurred between white workers and their bosses. Rather, it was the contradiction that existed between slavery pure and simple, the pedestal, and wage slavery or the capitalist production and all the capitalist relationship that rested on this pedestal of slavery. We have said all along that the class question is concentrated in the colonial question. That is the only explanation why European revolution has never happened. Even the existence of what they call the Soviet Union had to be explained by Lenin in retrospect. Before the Russian revolution, all the communists throughout Europe and even the Bolsheviks have said that socialist revolution would happen in Western Europe first. They believe the, Rus the revolution in Russia was to get rid of the Tsar to overthrow feudalism. Since according to their theory, feudalism led to capitalism, it would have to be a revolution ushering in capitalism. We just heard that argument earlier when we were looking at that discussion that was happening in Stuttgart in 1907 among communists. Even after the February revolution in 1917, most of the Bolsheviks refused to try to make a socialist revolution because it defied everything they said was supposed to happen. What then is the historical basis for the rise of socialism? That's the question. The historical basis for the rise of socialism is the destruction of the pedestal upon which the whole capitalist edifice rests. The historical basis for the rise of socialism is the revolutionary activity throughout Africa and among the African communities of the US, throughout Asia and Latin America. This ongoing process becoming deeper with every go around is what has been consistently undermining capitalism and imperialism, and therefore bringing us closer to a period where socialist revolution on the world scale is finally a real possibility. My book, An Uneasy Equilibrium, the political report to the party's sixth Congress was one of our most definitive statements providing the basis for my conclusion that colonialism was the mode of production moving Europe out of feudal destitution and despair. This same process created the conditions for the development of both the European bourgeoisie and working class from the same fabric that gave rise to the fundamental unity of opposites of the colonizer and colonized that constitutes a mode of production. I stated, quote, and this uh, uh, again is uh, from uh, the political report this part of the Sixth Congress. Our party and movement were forced to conclude that all humans, including Europeans are trapped by an absolute necessity to secure and develop the means of subsistence. In other words, the primary motivating factor in human society is the production and reproduction of life. Without life, all other questions, religion, culture, genetics, etc., cetera, are moot, meaningless. Indeed, culture is a byproduct of the process of producing and reproducing life. However, the process of Africans producing and reproducing life was drastically disrupted and altered by the European attack that resulted in the capture and colonial enslavement of Africa and Africans. This attack by Europeans on Africa also resulted in the imposition of artificial borders that separate the dispersed African nation from our human and material resources and from a meaningful relationship among ourselves and with the peoples of the world. The material and human resources of Africa have gone to satisfy the requirements of life for Europeans at the expense of Africa and Africans. The process of Africans producing and reproducing life has not been primarily for Africa and Africans. It has been primarily for Europe and the white world at our expense. This progenitor of world capitalism, 
the attack on Africa and Africans, along with the European assault on Asia and the Americas, rescued Europe and Europeans from an oppressive thousand-year-long disease-ridden, impoverished existence known as feudalism. This was the genesis of the capitalist system as a world economy created on a base of the enslavement of Africans and others. A scientific analysis of human society requires that we take a dialectical approach. We cannot see the world as static and ready-made. Society has to be analyzed as a process that is in a constant state of motion, change, and development. There's always something new arising to replace the old. And all social motion occurs in relationship to this process of coming into existence and dying away. Europe's attack on Africa was effectively an assault on Africa's ability to produce life for itself. This assault has been has had the effect of pushing Africa and Africans out of history. Af- slavery, genocide, and colonialism are the stuff of which capitalism was born. African enslavement was first capital in the development of capitalism. The prevailing legal system, culture, religion, and general philosophical outlook or worldview constitute the superstructure of capitalism thus conceived. This superstructure is a natural product and reflection of this economic base of colonial slavery. Slavery and colonialism gave rise not only to capitalism, but also to the capitalists and working classes alike of Europe and North America, the workers and the bourgeoisie. The two primary capitalist defining classes have occasionally fought great battles with each other since their inception as contending social forces. Nevertheless, Both were born and developed on a platform of slavery and colonialism. Consequently, what is often called class struggle inside the U.S. and Europe is actually contention among the workers and the ruling class for control of the parasitic capitalist pedestal and its stolen resources. The parasitic foundation of world capitalism continues to exist up to now as the true economic base upon which the entire superstructure of the capitalist-defined, capitalist-dominated world rests. The total existence of white people and their ability to produce and reproduce life is dependent on this parasitic relationship that came into being with the attack by feudal Europe on Africa and the world. Instead of separate, more or less contained, self-contained world existing in casual relationship to each other, There's one capitalist world system united by a parasitic economic relationship imposed by Europe upon the rest of us. There's therefore no European reality separate from that of Africa and the rest of the world. The entire world is now locked into a single dialectical process, a unity of opposites, whereupon the gruesome extraction of life and resources from Africa and the rest of the world is a condition for the life and development of what we now know as Europe, white people, and the capitalist system to which we have been forcibly affixed. The legal system, culture, white sense of sameness, and political institutions are reflections of this parasitic economic base. Every white aspiration and dream, every expectation of, for happiness and a good life, from a successful marriage to a secure future for their children, requires drone strikes in Pakistan, police murders, and mass imprisonment in the African colonies and barrios of the U.S. and starvation and forced displacement of the oppressed throughout the world. This, comrades, is a mode of production that rescued Europe at our expense and is generally defined as, quote-unquote, human progress when viewed through the lenses of European intellectuals, including the Marxist colonials who love us. That was Chairman Mali Chitella. Colonialism as the Mode of Production. Chairman Amalia Chatella will be presenting this chapter and more of his political report at the 3rd Plenary to the 7th Congress of the African People's Socialist Party, February 11th through the 14th, 2022. More info on the plenary is available at APSPplenary.org. That's APSPplenary.org. The plenary and the full episode of Amali Tabmi are at the Burning Spear TV YouTube page. You have been listening to Black Power Talks, produced by WBPU, Black Power 96.3 FM in St. Petersburg, Florida. Today, we discuss colonialism as the mode of production, with excerpts of a presentation made by Chairman O'Malley Esatella. Our theme song 
Get Up and Do Something, was written and performed by Elika and Goma. Thanks to the Black Power Talks production, research, and promotions team, including Jaja Robinson, Empress Livewire, and the Hips of Pounder.